Good morning, everyone. So my name is Nadi Guladi. I'm a program manager at Project for Public Spaces. I lead our streets and transportation program there. I'm also a visiting faculty here at Pratt, um, and I write a lot about this topic because it's more a labor of love, a topic of my interest, and something that I sort of layer on all the assignments that I take on. Um, I am born and raised Indian, so that plays a role in what I do as well, and I live in New York City now. So earlier this year, we saw this kind of peace circulate around. It was like, oh, the future of cities is childless. You know, we're not going to have as many kids and families living in cities. And whether or not this was factual, uh, or whether or not this is going to be true in the future, it did something really great that it started a conversation with, you know, is it true? Is there really um, an epidemic coming up? Uh, for lots of us in the room here, this was not news. You know, we were already thinking about some of these things and how our cities impact um, uh, children and young families. So then City Lab did another piece as sort of a follow-up to, to this particular piece where it actually looked at, is that true now? Do our cities have kids um, in them and is that part of the population? And the reality is that right now our cities are not childless. We do have lots of young families and kids living in cities. So the thing is, what can we do now to at the very least maintain this population of children in cities and make sure that our cities are caring to the demands of these families because again another part of the reality is that our cities aren't really designed for kids we already heard that this morning uh, we know that at lots of different systemic levels cities are failing um, caregivers families and children and this is not unique to the united states because as somebody who is not from here born and raised in a different country i know that this problem is worldwide and i know that the people who live in, in poverty and the families who live in poverty are much more vulnerable to how our cities are designed and much more vulnerable to the ways in which um, you know our cities are actually failing um, i'm going to quickly go through this because i think to through this morning we've kind of driven the point home that it's important um, to think about cities um, for kids because the cities that are designed for kids Think about kids as individual people. They are part of you know, our population. They're, they're citizens in their own right and should not have to rely on their parents representing them in many different ways. Um, the cities that are for kids really benefit the healthy development, physical, social, and cognitive. The cognitive, um, we know now that it's being studied, but in a large part um, you know, is, is not widely recognized that there is a cognitive development aspect of cities that is really beneficial for kids. Um, kid cities that are designed for kids allow for that transition from dependent species to independent species, because we know that human beings, when we're born, are some of the most dependent living organisms on the planet. So the cities can actually help uh, transition that from that dependence to independence. Um, this topic is very, very close to my heart. Again, it's 2019. We all ought to be thinking about tolerance. And uh, I believe and would love to research this further. I'm looking at you, Vitae. Um, how can our cities really help build tolerance and can we in some way start to measure that? If kids do come in contact with each other, different languages, different smells, different skin tones, different habits, everything, how can we, through that interaction, start to build tolerance? We're not quite getting to love thy neighbor, maybe that will happen, but how do we sort of tolerate thy neighbor and take that um, surprise of the other out of it a little bit? In cities that are for kids, obviously, think about the unique vulnerabilities that children um, have, as opposed to somebody who's you know, older. Um, and those cities also counter the impact of top-down decisions on the lives of these hopefully, you know, fully considered citizen, um, citizens, they account for those. And cities that are designed for kids also allow for growth in place for the children and aging in place for their families because it's not just about the kids, it's about the caregivers, it's about their families. So it's good for all of them. So this is kind of, as I said, this is a labor of love. I want to thank the publications that I draw these things from and there are many others I'm sure I missed um, because it's, it's important for us to think about a city that doesn't work for kids, doesn't really work for everyone else either, uh, because they are more vulnerable in lots of different ways. So let's think about a little bit of a paradigm shift here. So from an invis invisible population in our decision making to an empowered uh, population in our decision making, how would we make that happen? I'll just leave it here. 
We have to acknowledge that when we are young, when we're three or four, we're more creative than we ever are in our whole lives. And our cities are almost kind of feeding that creativity out of us. So the people who are making decisions are probably not even the most creative. And we're not listening to our most creative population. So how do we empower those little kids to come out and um, inform the way we design them? So some of the outcomes, this is literally stolen word by word from the uh, UNICEF's Child Friendly Cities Initiative. So this is not my work, this is just an acknowledgement of what some of these outcomes would look like. So empowerment would involve influencing decision making about their city. So kids having a voice um, in the decision making. Kids having um, an opportunity to express their opinions about the kind of city they want them participating in family, community, and social life. Kids have their own social life, so they will have right to do that. They will receive basic services, obviously very important, healthcare, education, and shelter, um, access to safe drinking water, access to proper sanitation, much more important in uh, vulnerable communities and lower income communities, of course. They will be protected from exploitation, violence, and abuse. They will be able to walk safely in the streets on their own, because again, that cognitive development and that social development They'll be able to meet their friends and play on their own, have green spaces for plants and animals and other kinds of life. They'll be able to live in an unpolluted environment, participate in cultural and social events, and be equal citizens of their city with access to every service, regardless of ethnic origin, religion, income, <coughs> gender, or ability. So this is a work in progress. I wanna say uh, that I've included my Twitter here, especially so you can tell me how will, um, how will we build on this? So 10 ways in which we can actually create um, cities for kids, allowing them to participate um, in civic processes from a very early age in simple processes to some of the more complex where they actually get to tell us how will we design their cities. Having child-friendly legal frameworks that like can kids have a representation legally um, and there are some countries that are trying to tweak the laws that they already have. The Children's Bill in Scotland recently uh, included some modifications to empower kids even further. Citywide strategies and comprehensive plans that put the needs of kids and uh, their caregivers at the very forefront. Um, Tel Aviv is doing some cool things. You should go look into it because I know I have only two minutes. Um, but at different levels, uh, even American cities are looking at how kids get to be visible in cities. So through play streets in LA, play streets in New York City, I would encourage American cities to look beyond play when it comes to kids. There are other ways in which kids need to be empowered and not just be able to play. Um, there should be stewards for kids' rights within government uh, for representation and accountability. A little shout out to my own home country, the Child Friendly Smart City <coughs> Initiative in India is trying to do some cool things. There is some representation at the national level. I hope to research this further as well and see how at the city level these things are being represented. <coughs> budget mandates to support these plans because nothing's going to happen until money is actually allocated. So, um, you know, how do we think about different ways in which um, cities can support families by actually fiscally supporting them? And the world is watching and these, the results of these things are going to start showing. This is a table that recently um, was circulating again, a research done by UNICEF about how child-friendly city policies in the sort of developed wealthy West are actually, um, you know, actually stack up, and the U.S. is not even on the on the chart. So, you know, there's something for us to think about. Further mandates. You can see that in Sweden, 480 days of paid paternal leave. They're publicizing it. Everybody can find it out. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we're talking about. Um, this is research from EU. How different countries are allocating percentage of their GDP to support families. Um, so budget mandates are very important. Um, how do we create infrastructure that supports the needs of families? So beyond city plans, beyond comprehensive plans, how in our day-to-day -day infrastructure, um, you know, can we support the needs of, of children? Can they be autonomous? Can they be their own? Can they enjoy, learn, play? Um, Child-friendly transit, walkability. This is a picture, I believe, from Brooklyn. I could be wrong. Um, and then it's important for us to continue to uh, evaluate that and have mandates at the city level to continue to evaluate how we're doing. Different places are doing it in a different way. Argentina, they're creating a framework that is collectively created by NGOs, universities, and grassroots organizations. Whereas in Canada, um, there is a citywide Waterloo region in Ontario has a child well-being dashboard that actually has a framework and four categories to actually measure the indicators. Uh, Korea is testing some self-assessment tools to figure out how they are um, having an impact. 
And then continue to build awareness, um, not just in adults by potentially giving them you know, stroller training, people who are not a young family themselves or don't understand the needs of young families, can we in some way put them in young families' shoes? So things like stroller trainings can help build education, but training the kids themselves too, that they have a voice, they have thoughts that are valid. Um, shout out to traffic gardens, um, and they do a lot of learning by actually implementing traffic gardens that kids get to learn. And let's continue to share knowledge in forums like this one where we are today. Um, and to make any of this happen, we're gonna need cross-agency collaborations. So all our agency peers, let's take note that you're all gonna have to work together. So in addition, in addition to having that, the people at the top who are kind of being the stewards of the entire pro program, each agency is gonna have to work together. Going back to Tel Aviv, I found on their Urban 95 initiative, a chart of how many organizations actually have to work together in order to make sure that the initiatives um, are being fulfilled and that impact is being had. So this is just a glimpse, irrespective of who fits in that green, yellow, or blue box. There are lots and lots of players who are gonna have to learn to work together. And us, the nonprofits, the grassroots, are gonna definitely play a role because sometimes we need to support where government can't um, you know, fulfill some of the things. And we need to empower kids in that too. Like we have to think of children as part of that multidisciplinary, multi-agency collaborative. Not the first person to quote Margaret Mead today. Um, you know. And here's me. If I missed anything, this is a work of labor. Help me and we'll hopefully develop a better framework. Thank you.